Okay, I suppose you're wanting to know why I'm in green. Well, I just want to let you know how, how sometimes that we need to realize who we are. How many know there's two of you? An old Jew, speak for yourself, pastor, and a new you, the old man, the new man, amen. Notice I didn't say old lady, new lady. I just did. Anyway, and so basically, what we want to avoid as Christians is putting on the old man during the week. We have a good service Sunday. We usually get tanked up, filled up. Ladies have a great Bible study. We have a great Wednesday service over at Linda and Sherry's home. You're all invited. And we get tanked up. But during the week, there's this tendency to put our old man on. And how many know our old man could be kind of gaudy? Kind of loud? If you ever knew my old man... <laughs> If you ever knew my old man, boy, that sounds good. But the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 12, it says, be not conformed to this world. Be transformed, right? And it says, bring your body and make it a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. So this is how tough your body is. Can it stand up on its own? No. That's why you don't walk around as a Christian living from your natural man. Your natural man is just a bag of goods. Everyone say, poor me. <laughs> and then you'll notice I have a, a weird shirt on. This is my carnal mind. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the Bible says we need to take off our old thinking and put on new thinking, renewing our mind in the Word of God. Can you say amen? How many ever had to take off the old man sometimes during the week? Come on, amen. Some of you take off some of that carnal thinking. Hello? When the enemy says you can't, God says you can, there's sometimes that exchange. Are you ready to get in the Word today? today. I've got some great things. We're still going to be sharing on the kingdom and on things like that. We've got some great things. Did I leave anything out? Okay, I got the high sign I can preach. <laughs> All right. Hey Amen. What season is it? How many years? Not what you're taught. It's what you caught. Amen. It's what you catch. I love it. Every time she gets ready, she's looking down. Do you do that on purpose? You ready, Diana? You can do it. Toss it back. Okay, let's try it. Ah, yeah. Amen. So anyway, got our family looking down there and all lots of people watching now, and we're so excited. So we've been doing a teaching on new creation realities. Our young ones are going to be dismissed for children's church, and we just appreciate that. Amen. Have fun. Anyway, so as we get into it, so we've been teaching on new creation realities. Who we are actually and what we have in Christ Jesus. Say amen. And today we're going to be talking about the unshakable kingdom. Say unshakable. So greetings to you, family of God. Those of you coming into the camera, this is the day the Lord hath made, but we choose to rejoice and be glad in it and in him. How many here woke up in God this morning? How many here woke up with him and in God? So you're already in victory. Can you say amen? So we're going to teach you about how the enemy works, what he does, and how to catch him and to make him neutralize or to neutralize him. How many would like to do that? 
Amen. So remember the enemy works on dissension, arguing, turning one person against another, saying to your brain, so-and-so doesn't like you, and saying to the so-and-so's brain, so-and-so doesn't like you, and so there's indifference. The enemy uses indifference. He uses wars, rumors of wars, rumors, uh, gossip, anything to create people to face one another in opposition. How many know Satan came and did that with Adam and Eve in the beginning? He says, God didn't really say this. What did he do? He gave an alternative teaching that was in opposition to God. So the enemy works just that way. God's kingdom is united. Can you say amen? It's in harmony with heaven. God's kingdom we have to be united with. So we accept Jesus Christ and he makes us one with the universe of God's kingdom. Can you say amen? It's called the kingdom of heaven. It came at Pentecost. Now I'm kind of getting all excited and fired up about this, but let me share a couple other things. This is the reason we are to study and meditate the Word of God so that God can bring you and I forth by faith, by His Word. Say amen. The enemy can't fight against God in His wisdom. And we are to follow Jesus Christ, establishing His kingdom in the earth. Remember, the enemy doesn't have access into the kingdom of heaven. So the works that he does is try to hide the kingdom from you. Try to hide spiritual answers from you. Try to tell you you're not worthy. Try to paint another picture for you. Because you are the children of the Most High. You're the children of light. You're blessed coming in. You're blessed going out. Your store is blessed. Your basket is blessed. Your womb is blessed. God forbid for some of his older ones. <laughs> It says everything that you shall do will be blessed. And God has redeemed you from the curse of the law. So what Satan has been doing is telling stories about God that are not true. And lying about his access to his kingdom. So you and I wear ourselves out trying to live for God naturally. Feeling unworthy of God himself. And yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Say that's me. I'm on my way to heaven. So I want to tell you. Satan can't stop you from going to heaven. Say amen. But he might want to make your trip miserable. So we have to get all of his lies and everything that he does as much washed out of our thinking as we can. Can you say amen? And in order to do that, we have to get our head into the word of God. We have to study the word. And we have to follow after Christ and know his character and know his likeness. Look at your neighbor and say amen. You see, the difference between religion and knowing Christ is just that, the results of walking with God. There's a lot of wonderful Christians out there, but many don't know they could walk with Jesus. Hand in hand, arm in arm, in one. He's in us, we're in him. My goodness. This is what we're supposed to wake up every morning when we arise. All right, so the name of this is the unshakable kingdom. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, look at 17 through 20. Let's see if I can get my cereal going here. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. All right. I'm reading from the New King James, so follow along. It says in verse 17, do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. There's a lot of teaching out there that says Jesus destroyed the law. The law is no good. No, he fulfilled the law. In other words, everything that the law needed for its fulfillment, Jesus did. We learned that last week. Can you say amen? All righteousness, everything that's written of him. But... He also has to reveal the kingdom by his spirit to us so that we don't work against the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? For the spirit resists the proud and gives grace to the amen. That's exactly right. So it goes on. So I do not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Verse 18. For surely I say to you, all heaven and all earth will pass away. But one jot or one tittle by no means will pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Who fulfilled it? 
Come on, say it boldly. Jesus. So why are the people down the street practicing it? Good question. They're deceived. And yet they're having a good time doing it because the devil will leave them alone. If you're deceived and you're having a good time at it, do you think the devil's going to tell you you're doing wrong? <laughs> no. No, I'm not picking on them. I'm really not. But see, most Christians don't know enough about the Word of God to keep them protective, to keep themselves in God's hands for protection. They just venture out. I, I could tell you, 20 years back, the Church of Jesus Christ were following fads. Do you know what a fad is? If you wear a thin tie, everybody wears thin ties. If you wear a dress, some people wear dresses. It's following the crowd. How many here that know that the crowd's not always right? Remember Joshua and the 12 spies? Huh? Right? The majority wasn't right. See? So don't you despise small churches and little things, because usually we get it quicker than all the rest trying to play the political game. Say, oh, me. Now, I'm not against any church. There's a big one down here that I wanted to be a part of. And God says, no, I have something else for you. Oh, shucks. Amen. So let's go on. Are you still with me? Then he goes on, verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of these least of these commandments in the law and teaches men shall, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Look at this phrase. And whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about principles, not following the law. So if I told you, hey... You don't need to please God. You can do your own thing. You're still saved. I'm least in the kingdom. But if I say, oh, God loves you so much, and you don't have to try to fulfill the law, he'll come into your heart and fill the law for you. I will be called great in the kingdom. Why? Because I'm preaching the truth and not a, a fulfilled covenant that passed already, the Old Testament. So everyone say, I study the Old Testament in light of the New Testament through the eyeglasses of Jesus. And when you do that, the Old Testament won't stumble you. Can you say amen? All right, so we're going to cover four areas. Everyone say four areas. All right, these four areas, if you're taking notes. Number one, avoid a divided kingdom. Avoid a divided kingdom. Every kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. So evidently, you sport around the kingdom of God, and you sport around your own little kingdom. Now, your own little kingdom's okay if it agrees with God's kingdom. You can see, say amen. But a lot of times we have things in our life that really God's not pleased with, and he's not going to get on your case for it. He's going to, little by little, he's going to show you what things to phase out, what things to phase in. Can you say amen? That's because he's training you up to be a champion. He's not training you up to be some kind of a... a, a a mess. He's training you up to be a champion. So we got to listen. We got to pay attention. Understand what the will of the Lord is concerning us. Say amen. All right. So we're going to cover avoid divided kingdoms. Two, we're going to know the difference between the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. And we're going to look at just a couple items with those. And then three, we're going to look at the Cain and Abel syndrome. The Cain and Abel syndrome. What did Cain do to Abel? Yeah, Cain represents Satan. Okay. Abel represents a born-again believer, you, the believer. Also, Cain is your flesh. How many here knows your flesh would rather have you stay home and watch it on TV? <laughs> Amen. And I want to give you another one. Here's one that God revealed to me a long time ago. But he said, we have to be careful who sits on our throne. Can you say amen? Did you know you have a throne where God should sit on your throne? Can, can you say amen? You are the temple, aren't you? And if you're the temple of God individually, temple of God, then there's a throne in you, isn't it? It's called your spirit. Now, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians, see if I can quote it right, I don't want to mess you up, says that he who declares who is not God declares himself to be God, and he sits where God should be sitting. 
Now that's the story of the Antichrist coming into the temple, okay, and declaring himself to be the Messiah. But if you think about it, who should be Lord of your life? So when you are sitting on your own throne, it's an anti-God, isn't it? Because we don't always want to obey God. So be careful that you're not in charge of your life, because then you'll find the results that you get are not always the best. Okay? So remember, the Antichrist sits in the temple declaring himself to be God. If we listen to the enemy, then the enemy will sit on our temple, and he'll try to control our life and make it a disaster. Everyone say, not me! Come on, say it like you mean it. Not me! Yeah, I want everybody to know how many people are here. So, so the, again, and then the Cain and Abel syndrome, avoid it, and then for receiving the unshakable kingdom. How do we do all of that stuff? I'm glad you're here. So let's look at the first point. Avoid divided kingdoms. Go with me to Mark chapter 3. I don't know about you, but I lived in a very active family who at some times would be angry at each other. And even a house divided against his house shall not. Right. So Satan works on creating division. Okay. That's how he works. So he'll come in and he'll try to divide your mind away from your heart. And try to say, well, nobody really likes you at that church. Why don't you just kind of follow your, you know, walking around, placing yourself in different churches is not the will of God. Finding a good church and planting yourself there is the will of God. Okay. God is not raising up floating kidneys in the body of Christ. <laughs> And there are plenty of people in the Northwest that can't sit any one place because the moment they get their feelings hurt, they move around like a bunch of little chess people. And that's not very good at all. Listen, the things about your feelings, everyone say feelings, it's your flesh. So don't run by your feelings because it's your flesh. Well, I have good feelings too. Yeah, after you do something good, it's still your flesh. So if we go by our flesh, are we being led by the Lord? And there is where 60% of the body of Christ is sitting. Don't you dare insult me. That's not politically correct. All this jimble, jobble, marble, mad at everything. Satan loves it. He's having a bathing heyday of energy. Because once people start fighting, he feeds. Once people get mad at somebody else and has unforgiveness, he feeds. Every time somebody threatens somebody else, he feeds. So what do we do? We love God, we love others, and we share Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. And he can't feed off of us. We're going to get you to a place where Satan can't even come around you. Because you're so threatening with God in you. He doesn't want to get his head all beat in. Remember it says, and he shall crush your head. Genesis 3.15, Jesus will crush your head, Satan. Where does Jesus live, folks? Learn to bring him out so he can crush Satan's head. Get up in the morning, you won't even have to yawn twice, and you'll already have the devil's head crushed. Hello, because you're not doing it. You're releasing God who did it. Say Amen. All right, let's get into this. All right. Avoid divi uh, divided kingdoms. So Mark 3, look what it says in verse 23. So he called them to himself. He's talking to his disciples. And he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. We know that, right? That's why Satan's trying to get the churches all divided. Listen. Listen. You're not going to get me anymore to comment in, in any way against another Christian. I'm just not going to do it anymore. Because it gives Satan license. You license him. So I'd rather just keep my mouth shut and say, oh, aren't they nice? But don't do it in a snidely way. Oh, aren't they nice? You know what I mean? Because whether you know it or not, how does the devil know when to attack? 
Number one, everyone, write this down. Your tones of your sound. How do you sound? Fine. Why do you ask? <laughs> he runs on tone. He can't read your brain, but he can listen to how you talk. He can tell how stressed you are because it comes out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth slippeth. How else does he tell how negative we are? How many here's ever gone on vacation and forgot to dump your kitchen garbage? And it's full of fish. Just for you, Sherry. <laughs> you know it's going to stink. When people are negative and they don't faithfully pray to God every day, they're going to start stinking. And please, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm just, the enemy will pick up on your vibes. Whoop, we got a little Sherry there, we're going to buzz her. Here comes Bill's above. <laughs> Hello. What else can he do? He can see your countenance. How many here know you have a light shining out of you? Raise your hand and say, I have light shining out of me. So don't let it go dim. Amen. How does it work? Well, you got God in here. He shines out through your soul on to your physical realm. Now, if he's shining out but your head's all screwed up, is he going to get out here? No, you're going to block him here. That's why your head's got to be dosed into God's word and his presence every day so it yields to God and doesn't resist God. Say amen. So it says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, a kingdom cannot stand. Verse 25, and if a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, he's divided, he cannot stand, he is an end. That's the end of him. And that, I pick Mark for the reason. Okay, now listen to the next phrase. 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then he will spoil his house. Folks, that's a story about what Jesus did. Satan took this earth from Adam, didn't he? Come on, you know that much. And he kicked God off, didn't he? So, Jesus is now like a thief. Satan didn't know he's going to be born of a virgin. He didn't quite have all the pieces put together, for had he had known, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory, it says. But he didn't. And Jesus got in, left hook through Mary, and Jesus was born. Can you say amen? Most marvelous thing. Most marvelous thing. Because somebody greater than Satan has come. And he came like a thief through Mary. And he walked for three, 33 and a half years and rose again from the dead. The story is Jesus came, surprised Satan, bound him, struck him down, and then spoiled his goods. Now, I don't know about you. I've had my house broken into. I mean, it was a long time ago. Stereos and, and um, laptops taken out of here, equipment off our stage, everything, you know. And it was done by somebody who said that we're a Christian. So you be careful. But at the same, the thing I'm saying is, is Jesus bound him and spoiled his goods. Now, look at your neighbor. Say, you are the goods that say, Satan lost. All of you. You were in Satan's house. Then you got born again. You have Jesus in your heart. He spoiled you. He removed you out of darkness, put you into the kingdom of his son. Can you say amen? And he's spoiling. He's still spoiling the earth. Satan's house because he bound him up. He's rebuked him. Now our job is to go tell people the good news that Jesus is not mad at the world anymore, that the world through him might be saved. Someone say amen. So, God came down into the earth and divided Satan's kingdom. Now, the problem was, is the religious people of the day thought Jesus was casting out the devil by the prince of the devils. And that's why the term, the kingdom cannot be divided against itself. So, what Jesus did is he came down and he put a kibosh on the devil and split his kingdom. 
And let me tell you something that inside people know. You might not know, but you will. You know, even some of Satan's workers that work for him can't even agree with him. So he's not all that organized, especially when you know who you are, what you have, where you're at, and heavenly places in Christ, and competence. The Bible says, don't throw away your competence, which has great recompense and reward, for you have need of endurance. So after you've done the will of God, you'll receive the promise. God takes no joy to those that pull back into perdition but takes joy to those of the fulfillment of God's word. Say amen, that's you. So God doesn't want a divided kingdom, and that's what Jesus is doing through you and I. We're dividing people away from his kingdom and getting them saved. Say amen. I like what it says. Um, let me read this to you, okay? I want to make sure I get this all, all together, okay? Any kingdom divided against itself, he cannot stand, including your house. That's why you avoid fighting. Somebody wants to argue and tell you a thing or two, smile. You say, you know, you're probably right, even though they're probably wrong. But a soft answer turns away what? Wrath. And no answer shuts it down. Jesus didn't answer when they accused him. Remember? He said, you say, call me king of the Jews, you say, Jesus never brought attention to himself, always to the Father. Can you say amen? Never bring attention to yourself, bring it always to Jesus. Say amen. So, this is the vital thing that Jesus wants us to know, that we can bind the devil up at any time. We can render him ineffective. And the problem is, some of us don't know how smart we really can be. Why bind the devil for tomorrow? Why don't you get him for the whole week? Let me tell you a little funny thing, and then we'll move on to the next point. I used to have a lot of altar calls, and people would just lay out all over the floor. I mean, get slayed in the spirit and everything. But that, that can really cause a lot of confusion, and I still have that. But I watched people come forward, and I'd lay hands on them, and their arm would get healed. And then I'd give another altar call, Lord's going to heal backs now. And the same person will get up and now say, oh, I got my back wants to get, I thought, what about your arm? Well, my arm's healed, and I want my back healed. Why didn't you get the whole package when you came up? <laughs> so sometimes we're not as smart as we'd like to think we are. Why don't we pray in months in advance over our family and over our loved ones so God has time to work it all together? Get a list out and start planning and plotting. Say, we're taking back our kingdom for the glory of God. Amen? Instead of sitting around sad banging, get me through the day, Lord, and I'll follow you twice as hard tomorrow. <laughs> Come on. Now, I'm not referring to you. You know better. All right, second point. Be ready like the ten virgins. So let's look at it. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 10. I don't preach myself happy up here. This sometimes I'll go so quick that my eye tooth will, my tongue will go over my eye tooth and it won't see what I'm saying. It's just kind of a weird thing, you know. All right, so let's look at this. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven, what? When we hear kingdom, what does it mean? Dominion, power, and influence. God's dominion, power, and influence. Say amen. Then the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. That's Jesus. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Hello. Just, just a lesson of preparation is what this is. This isn't a guilt trip, okay? Those who were foolish took the lamps and took no oil with them. This is a picture, now listen, I never knew this until a little while ago, of religion with no Jesus. They have a lamp, but there isn't any oil. 
Oil is God. Say, oil is God. Oil is anointing. Oil is God. Okay? So they have the lamp, but they didn't have God. See, he, remember, Jesus is trying to get the Jews to convert, to get born again, because they were all Judaized. We be the Jewish people. We don't need to be saved. We are Abraham's seed. And Jesus said, these rocks, I can bring people out of Abraham. Get it together, folks. So they had lamps, but they had no oil. It's kind of like having a toaster and no toast. <laughs> I'll toast something. Michael, let me see your hand. No, are you with me? You can laugh at that, brother. I sure love you. Amen. So you catching this? Took no oil for their lamps. Okay. All right. But when the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, see, with their vessels and they had an extra vessel with their lamps. He's talking about praying out into the future, collecting a lot of God before you get there. So that when you get there, your bag is full of oil and everybody else is wanting to borrow it from you. Your bills are paid and people want you to loan the money. You see? Hello? There's somebody. You need to watch over your finances because people are looking at you as a bank. You're not a bank. You're a child of God. All right? That's a word for somebody. So no matter what you hear, make sure God's in behind it because he always reverses what you loan. But if you start loaning stuff he told you not to, then you kiss it bye-bye, okay? That's why we need to listen to God and stop being religious. Amen? All right. Do you see the difference? One was religious, had no, had lamps, no oil. One had lamps and oil and an extra vessel. That's you. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, you look like a wine bag. I love you. I used to call them boda bags. Did you used to have a boda bag, you know? Fill it up with the wine and have it crack. Oh, anyway, so, okay, so let's go on. Verse 6. And at midnight the cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some. We don't go to church. Now listen to me carefully. We don't go to church to learn about Jesus. We go to church to find a friend. That's why your lamps are not full. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. We go to meet with Jesus and sit at his feet so we tank up, get the understanding that we need for the future. Can you say amen? But there are a lot of people who go to church for every other reason but God. Now, I know it's sad, but that's the truth. All right, so let's move past that. Oh, please, Pastor Curry, that's too convicting. And I digress. So, but with the wise, they answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough of the oil for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. Now, this is a hard one that I had a problem with. You can't buy your salvation. You can't buy God. But these people who didn't have the oil, who didn't have God, thought they could. Who were they? They were the Jews. By works of our own righteousness, that saves us. The Jewish people believed that if they could keep the law, they would be saved. But nobody can keep the law, could they? So they believed that they could work hard enough, they could please God good enough, that they could buy their salvation. How many know you can't? We found out about the rich man, remember? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. Amen. Are you with me? So, no less we should not have enough for us and you, okay? And while they went 
to buy the bridegroom came and those that were ready went in and celebrated. Amen. How many here know that Jesus could come at any moment? I've been sharing a little a couple of clips on the rapture. Have you caught those? Catch those, okay? Because that's exactly what it's going to be. I could be talking right now and boom, we're gone. Everything to fulfill Jesus' catching us away has been already fulfilled. We're just waiting for the last soul to be saved. I believe, this is my conviction now, notice I said that, that there's somebody out there, it's the last soul that's going to be swept in and Jesus is going to come. You might be the one who wins them to the Lord. That's why we cannot be sitting around trying to fix our problems. We let God fix them. We meet with God and let him fill us so we can go out and touch the lives of others. Can you say amen? Let me tell you, there's no greater way than to touch a life is to do it with the anointing of God, you who have oil. Because when God is working with you, getting people saved is almost just like nothing. The anointing's already got them ready. All you have to do is have them pre repeat the prayer of salvation. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, you're Lord. Come into my heart. Forgive me and be my Lord and Savior. Boom! You're changed. When the anointing is working on a believer's life, people getting saved is almost automatic. But to try to squeeze salvation out of somebody that's not ready, it's like sour grapes. Someone say, oh, me. All right, are you ready? How many here are wise virgins? If you run into a foolish virgin, what should you say? Well, you've got to get some oil. Come on to church with me. Pastor Kerry will pray with you and get you saved. Let's get the oil in you. Amen. you kind of squeaky there, old sinner. Squeak, 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 squeak. I don't need to be scared. Squeak, squeak, squeak. You're the tin man. Let's put some oil in you. I got imagination. Sometimes it needs to be grabbed and pulled right back in here. All right, go to the third point. We need to avoid the Cain and Abel syndrome. Folks, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, all power is given to me both in heaven and on earth. How much? All. So he took all that power, stripped Satan. All Satan now has is the power and the ability to talk you out of your power and ability. What did he do with Adam and Eve? He took their birthright. He took the planet from them. Why is the devil after you? He doesn't want you to go to heaven. Well, you have something far greater than Adam and Eve have. You have Almighty God living on the inside of you. And the key is whenever you feel the enemy pressing in, just start worshiping and release God on him. Salt, salt, salt on the slug, slug, slug. Bullfrogs and butterflies, we've both been born again. Bullfrogs and butterflies, we've both been born again. An old tadpole near a fishing hole couldn't croak or jump to save his soul. And then one day, a funny thing, he started growing and turning green. He jumped up on a lily pad, croaking out a song, gave it all he had. Everybody sing! Bullfrogs and butterflies. You see, all of us are different, and God brings the good out of us, and he shuns the evil and separates us. Can you say amen? So there's a good separation of Cain and Abel. So everything the devil does is to be in opposition of you growing. So if he's going to be in your way, then you have to get him out of your way. Can you say amen? Do you remember Jesus saying, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou planted in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he continues to say, he shall have whatever he says. A mountain is an obstacle between point A and point B. And if you are on foot, it's a big obstacle. Hello, or on donkey. But see, we don't see the mountain as an obstacle. We see the mountain as a mountain, and it is. But it's also an obstacle. How many here have some more things to do for God? Do you see an obstacle like a mountain that says you can't, you can't, you can't? 
Start speaking to it. So you get out of the way of God's work in my life. And you tell that mountain, be thou removed. You stop hindering my job, hindering my business, hindering my family. I command you bound. I command you removed. And you get out into the sea of forgetfulness. Watch things start loosening up. Remember, you're just not the old person you used to be. You're a new pe person in Christ Jesus with a new covenant and Almighty God on the inside of you. Yeah! So, Satan works hard to short you out. Remember the story of the battery. How many here have a battery in your car? Two poles on it, right? What don't you do with those two poles? Mix them up. You don't touch them together. Your flesh is a negative pole, and your spirit's positive pole. You are learning to not touch them together. How am I doing that? By praying to God and asking God to remove your flesh that day. You're to lay your flesh down that day. If you're not meeting with God every day, you've already sinned. Now, that's not going to send you to the wrong place. It's just going to keep your walk rough. I want your walk smoother. How can I do that? Get into the paint cabinet and get charged up. Stop avoiding what is right. Well, I've done it for so long and got away with it. Yeah, yeah, this is the end times. You're not going to get away with much now. Now all that foolish stuff's gone. Amen. So, avoid the Cain and Abel. Go with me to 1 John chapter 3, 11 and 12. And if nothing else, just know this. Your flesh is Cain. Cain is supposed to die, not Abel. Say amen. Your spirit and soul are Abel. Now, just using the difference, they are contrary to one another. So that a person that is allowing both to talk to them, they're double-minded, unstable in all their ways. And what does it say? Let not that person sit, think they will receive a thing from the Lord. A double-minded man's unstable. Mowing from the flesh to the spirit, flesh to the spirit, blowing from the flesh to the spirit, flesh to the spirit. And so we're learning not to do that. Say amen. We're learning to crucify Cain. All right. So, in verse 11 it says, For this is the message, John is saying, that you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain was of the wicked one who murdered his brother. Now I got the hiccups, sorry. <laughs> murder. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. What a reason to kill your brother. Now, you got to realize that Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, there wasn't any women at this time. My conviction is there wasn't a woman. There's no sisters at this time. We got the two boys. And the two boys, God wants to appropriate, and the girls are coming. Now, who did Cain marry? Most Christians can't answer that, and that's why their Jehovah Witnesses got a bunch of pile of people down there. He married his sister. Removed. Far removed. She started popping out girls like you wouldn't believe. Hundreds of them. Then finally, after Cain killed Abel, another man came along. What was his name, Seth? Anyway, another, I've gotten another man, she says. Why would she say a statement? Because she was popping out girls for procreation of the earth. God knows what he's doing. Sorry, ladies, I didn't mean to make it sound so, you know. And then the men were the seed. Can you say amen? And so Satan immediately says, I got to get rid of those guys. They're going to populate this planet with godly people. And we know what happened, right? Cain slew Abel, and finally another, another ch boy was born. Now, I love Genesis. Genesis is one of my fun things I like to study. Because there's so many people that haven't figured out Genesis yet. And I don't want to stretch your mind, but 
you know, the first creation of God was destroyed. And what we're living is the recreation of what was destroyed. Think about that for a while. All right, moving right on. <laughs> so listen, have you ever seen Christians mad at each other? One's in Cain, one is in Abel. God doesn't want that because what does that do to the devil? It feeds the devil, doesn't it? You mad at your husband? Stop it. It's not worth it. Pray, go to God with him, say, God, get him. Otherwise, you're going to feed the devil. And the problem is going to get worse. You got a wayward child, it's kind of rebellion and seem like they're rebellious. A lot of apologies, a lot of prayer will heal the child rather than making excuses or saying that it was my fault and trying to give a lot of reasons why it is this way. Don't go back in the past to try to explain the present. Say, I blew it for the past. Lord, forgive me. And please, family, forgive me. And let's move on. How many has ever had somebody always bringing up your mistakes? How'd that make you feel, Bunky? Good. <laughs> Don't bring up people's mistakes. Everybody's aware of them. How, are you aware of your mistakes today? You got up. There you are. No big deal. God loves you. God cares about you. He's after you and your soul. He's not after you and the old man. He's going to make it new. How many here know our body gets changed? Are you getting some out of this? So we want to make sure we don't get into division with anybody. Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. House divided, church divided, family divided cannot stand. But a family united can stand forever. Say amen. All right. Ooh, glory to God. It's really foggy up here. All right. So we're wise. We're avoiding the arguments of life. Say amen. Let's see exactly what Paul's talking about. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 18, and then verse 25. Paul is speaking to the church of Galatia. And by the way, as soon as we finish this series on Wednesday, I'm going to start the book of Galatians on Wednesdays. We show you some mighty powerful truths that most of the church are not aware of. There's hidden right in the book of Galatians. In fact, some of the people that are doing the Jewish thing are told to never read the book of Hebrews, never read the book of Galatians. Isn't that amazing? They're told not to read their Bible. Something's wrong with that. Read all your Bible, everything. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it again. The Holy Spirit's the one who will teach you. Can you say amen? Don't piecemeal the Bible. I'm not going to study Galatians because it talks about us Judaizers. Yeah, it does. And says you're in error. All right, so move right on out. So this I say, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and that's a capital S, and the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary, so that you neither can do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Say amen. What law is he talking about? See, this is what a lot of Christians don't understand. There's a law in the earth. Everyone say law in the earth. And I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments only strengthen that law. You'll find it in Romans 8, 2. It's the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. You see, if you're a sinner, you're going to die. Unless you get saved. Hello. And death is where you're going to end up unless you get saved. Amen. Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. There's no death for you as a Christian. Oh, yes, there is. I have people die all the time. See, there you go thinking carnally again. You see, when a Christian passes, they close their eyes and they open their right before Jesus. No suffering. Now, you might have suffering in this, in this earth, in the hospital or something you might go through. Now, listen to me carefully. This is no extra charge here. Usually suffering, long suffering has to do with unforgiveness Cancers, most cancers are from that. 
get them to confess. I forgive everybody, my mom, my dad. I was raped when I was a kid. I forgive that person. I forgive that. Whatever it is, get them to unload the camel. And then healing is theirs, you see. But people suffer a lot with their diseases and, and things because we fight in the natural of trying to live. Instead of, Lord, if I go home today, it's great. And then God says, good, you'll live and not die. You see, so there's a lot of wrestling with evil and wrestling with pain and suffering when we carry something that's terminal. So we pray that none of you ever get anything terminal. And those that do get healed of terminal, been healed twice of it. Okay? And so we just want that to be so. Say amen. But the suffering comes because the flesh wants to hold on to everything. If we seek to hold on to our life, we shall... So there's a fine balance, and I'm not saying I know everything, that people suffering a lot has a lot to do with them trying to hold on to their self-life and not let go. Because for a Christian, dying is a graduation. But we were never taught that way. We're always taught grave and suffering and all that. No, it's a graduation. We don't really begin to live until we close our eyes and open them in heaven. Then there's no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more darkness, no more nah, blah, 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 nah. no more devil. <laughs> Amen. Now, a lot of you are already having some steak on the plate while you wait, aren't you? You're already seeing the word working and stuff. Just remember, when the word starts to work, the enemy, you start to back the enemy off. Don't take self-pleasure. I used to know a guy, he'd back the devil off his wife, off his family and everything, and then he would relax, go smoke a joint and drink a beer, and then the devil would just beat the tar right out of him. I just don't understand. Well, it's kind of like opening your back door and letting the devil come right in and steal you blind. Don't be opening the back door. You pray. Cover yourself every day. If you want to enjoy some beverage or something like that, dude, fine, but don't be an idiot about it. Oops, I said a word. Forgive me for that word. All right, finishing, everyone says, please let him finish. Okay, last point. Receiving the unshakable kingdom, all right? Go with me to Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll get right on through this. Now, how does God build his kingdom in the earth? Through you. We receive the word, it's the word of his kingdom, and the kingdom is being built in our hearts, right? Now, we have that, and the, the day of Pentecost, the kingdom came, didn't it? So now we have the kingdom in our heart, and we have the kingdom around us. We are a kingdom going to reign, can you say amen? And we will reign in life through one Christ Jesus, it says. So the reigning in life is us being comfortable to walk with God and his kingdom. Can you say amen? So God builds his kingdom in you through his word. And it's an unshakable kingdom. Has God ever lost a war? Ever lost a battle? Has he ever lost an argument? Has God ever lost anything? He lost you. I wasn't trying to trick you, but God says, and now he's went to hell and back to gain you back. S someone shout amen. amen. So let's look at this. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. When you see the term Mount Zion, that's talk about spiritual heaven, okay? Who shall ascend to the mountain of the Lord? He with clean hands and a pure heart. It's talking about heaven, but it uses the term as a mountain. All through the Old Testament, God met in special places. One was a mountain, didn't he? So we have not come to Mount, with, with cursings, uh, Mount Sinai, but we've come to Mount Zion. Now, do you know the two different mountains? No. <laughs> Write this down. Deuteronomy 28. You'll see that God divided the Israelites up in half. One side went to the Mount of Cursing, 
and the other went to the Mount of Blessing. And their job was to speak all the blessings over on the cursings, and all these on the cursing side speak all the cursings, and he says, now you are to obey the Lord your God, and turn not to the right hand, nor to the left, but proceed on. Of course, this is Old Testament. That's why it says in Galatians that Christ, when he came, he's purchased us out of the curse part of the law and gave us the blessings of Abraham, but he's taken the curse out of us. Say amen, everyone. So you're going somewhere to be blessed unless your mouth gets in the way. Okay, so you have come to Mount Zion, into the heavenly city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable company of angels, Woo! to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, to the those who are registered in heaven, for God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men rendered made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. Abel said judgment. Jesus says forgive them. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we escape and turn away from him who speaks from heaven? God is speaking to us from where? heaven. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places, yet we're seated here. So we have come to Mount Zion in the spirit realm, a place of great rejoicing, a place of great power. It's the kingdom of God's dominion, power, and influence. That's where you dwell. Unless you get up in the morning and somebody give you some bad news and you start talking all that negative stuff and then you sort of come down the mountain. Next week, we're going to show you what happens in the mountain. But anyway, let's continue on. Say, are you with me? Okay. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now has promised, saying, yet once I will shake the earth, but also the heaven. Verse 27. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken, the wheat and the chaff and the goats, as the things that are made and the things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's you. Say, I belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now look at this next phrase, okay? Verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve the living God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So that's who you are. You're in Mount Zion. You're surrounded with angels. Well, what's all the problem then? Because nobody's taught you. Nobody's shared with you. Nobody said, cap your lips because your lips were your worst enemy. Nobody's told you you can't hold on against somebody. Nobody's told you you can't be in unforgiveness. Now you have learned all these graces. And God says, I have much more to show you and much more to give you. In fact, Hebrews goes on and says, hey, this is just little stuff. If we can, I want to take us on to even greater stuff. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 6. Going on to the greater things of God's teaching. Can you say amen? amen? Now, what are we to avoid? A divided kingdom. Two. We are to what? Where's my notes? Three. Two, another difference if you're a ten virgins, five wild, five foolish, okay? Cain and Abel syndrome. Do not get mad at people. Just don't do it. Refuse it. Boy, that just, you can say, boy, that just frustrates me. That's okay. But don't carry the frustration off into your words and stuff. Hello? Did you get some out of that this morning? Would you give the Lord a hand clap? Yeah. Questions? 